Oh, you did? Oh, awesome. Okay, wow. I guess everybody got a nice story. <laughs> All right, let me, let me pray real quick again. Dear Lord, I pray that uh, you'll be with my mind and with my heart, Father, that uh, this, the, the words that I'm about to preach out of, your, uh, out of your Bible, Father, out of the words that you've given other people to write down. Lord, that this will be a time to up with Jesus. Father, please bless uh, these lips that it will be, uh, give honor to you, Lord God. We love you so much and we thank you. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the real Adam. Um, this one, as, as my time was coming up to, to deliver a message, uh, this one kind of, I sort of, I, I say I stumbled upon as if it was my doing, but uh, I stumbled upon that, uh, I think the Lord actually gave it to me, um, and it was inspired by other messages that I was listening to, and just, I think, and I hope, this lands well with everybody. So I know, let me, let me ask this question, what is the gospel? Good news. Good news, okay, but what does that mean? Jesus is coming, okay. Kingdom of God is at hand. Anybody remember what Pastor Jay used to say? Oh, uh-oh. Okay, so you guys knew it. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching. You guys know I'm going to be interacting. I'm sorry. Uh, Pastor Jay used to say this, and, and I have since, uh, since I've heard it, and I'm not disagreeing with what, what you guys have said. This is, that is definitely part of the gospel. But I think the, the greatest miracle or the greatest part of the gospel is God having the capacity and the ability to turn a sinner into a saint. That is a miracle. Understand that. And that's a miracle. I hope we can see how that becomes a miracle as, as we go through this. The gospel is, it, it is the good news, but the good news of the gospel, at least in part, is that God is good and he is out to try to shift humanity from where it is to where he is, if you will. So today we're going to be talking about the Messiah, Messiah um, and we'll, we'll kind of get into that in just a minute. First of all, I want to give you a, uh, we're going to talk a, uh, kind of a lot about uh, human philosophy, if you will, and uh, human theology. Oh, I think I'm a little hot here. Um, maybe I'll quiet down. Um, so, this is Thomas Callhill, and he is just a historian, strictly a historian. He is not some sort of big theologian. He is saying this from a historian perspective. Human beings are possessed of an unrelenting desire for the cycle of violence and horror in our world to end and give way to a mode of existence defined by beauty, truth, and justice. This is strictly from a historical perspective, from, from ar archaeology and reading the, the tomes of, of the hi historical uh, events that happen to other cultures. So as he's studied history, this is what he has concluded, more or less. And I would totally agree with this. This, this is, humanity is constantly trying to seek a utopia, right? That we, we are actually trying to seek it. But the interesting thing is, is as we're trying to seek it. We're trying to seek it without the right tools, without the right person in charge of it. This is what Jasper is reading, Acts 3, 19 through 21. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Let's hold on right there. Times of refreshing. Some versions call it restoration. See, this is what people are looking for. This is what he said people are looking for, the historian, right? This is what people are looking for. They're looking for that restoration. They want it. They desire it. But right here, what is it saying? The presence of the Lord. It only comes from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. Restoration of all things. Hey, Norma, could you bring down the monitors, please? 
Restoration of all things, which God has spoken by, by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. You see, a lot of us, we want to say, okay, well, and, and the kids and I, the, the book we're, we're reading, uh, which I actually, I would, I would honestly highly recommend it. It's, it's really good books. They're only about 150 pages each or 100 pages each. Um, it's called The Truth Chronicles, really good books. Uh, it actually, uh, they're brought out by Answers in Genesis. Uh, but one thing that they got mm, a little off last night as we were reading it, uh, they were talking about one of the characters was having a hard time with the Bible, right? So what, what do we, um, you know, he had a, one of his friends, I say friends, I loosely say the term friends, uh, one of his friends said, Hey, well, what, what about the New Testament and the Old Testament? What about the laws in the Old Testament? And then her, his friend was trying to give an answer and said, well, actually, there's a difference between the New and Old Testament. It's actually Israel and the church, and there's this... Ba-. But that's the common teaching. So we actually had an impromptu Bible study at about 10.30 last night as we were talking about this. And uh, it, it, humanity has this, this whole thing about the uh, Christ being the New Testament, right? But if you truly study the Old Testament, what do we find in the Old Testament? Jesus is everywhere. The Old Testament is the proclamation of the one to come. The whole thing. You look at the, we got, we're studying the Psalms, right? You look at the Psalms, you look at the historical stuff. You even look in Genesis, there's the, there's a proclamation. You look at the prophets, the major and minor prophets. They're always preaching this, this, this person that's supposed to come, that's supposed to restore everything, restore all things. See, humanity is going through an identity crisis, though. We have this problem. We, we, we look at the world around us and, don't raise your hand with this. Some people are on social media. Some people are not. If you are not on social media, good on you. Stay off it. Uh, social media is inundated with nothing but identity politics everywhere. And I, say, I don't mean identity politics as in, oh, are you a liberal or are you a, a Democrat or a Republican or left or right? Or, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about identity politics, identity arguments, identity debating. That's what I mean. It's nothing but, well, what gender are you? Well, what, what are you with this? Well, what's your orientation? Well, are you this, are you that? Well, if humanity is trying to place labels on themselves, as we just found out, without Christ, without God, it always, always falls apart. Every time. It will. It, it's, it's inevitable. But today we live in a world where there are three dominant atheistic theories of human identity. And I think I'm going to slide a fourth one in there at the end. Uh, these gentlemen are, anybody recognize any of them? Maybe, maybe not. I think they're all long dead. Um, so who you see up here is Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Sigmund Freud. These three men have very definitively shifted the world, and how we think about ourselves. They have defined humanity and given us identities. And I'm going to go through these very, very quickly here. So we have Karl Marx. Karl Marx basically states, uh, we are economic entities. Well, well, what does that mean? That means there are victims and there are victimizers, right? Now, mind you, I'm going to just say this up front. Karl Marx was not just pulling this out of thin air. This was something he was observing. And if truth be told, well, we kind of do see that around the world, but are we boiling us down? Are we boiling the identity of, to, uh, uh, of humanity down to just two things? Victimizers and victims? Hmm. So it's all about uh, tricking people into think. And, and this, is, this is what he, he does, uh, at least his, his, if I can say it, theology, uh, trick people into thinking it's necessary to have equal everything. Otherwise, it's not going to work. That's, that's Karl Marx. He's economic man. It's all about an economic exchange. Who's higher, who's lower, who's doing more of it, who's doing less of it. We have Friedrich Nietzsche. He is, er, he is the muscle man. 
the kind of man that we have, the kind of, by the way, when I say man, I mean mankind, okay? I'm talking about Adam, Adam, okay? In Scripture, it talks about Adam, A-D-A-M, Adam, right? Adam is a name, it doesn't just mean man, like the gender. It means mankind, okay? That's what, that's what this means. So muscle man means muscle mankind, muscle humanity, right? We are nothing more than engines of power compared to others. This is the point. There are the powerful and there are the weak. This is, in a lot of ways, where evolution comes from. Um, can anybody finish the sentence? The survival of? Oh, yeah. We've all been indoctrinated, guys. Sorry. We also have sexual man. So this is Sigmund Freud, and I will forego all of his experiments that he has done and psychological things. I would highly not recommend bringing those up in a church atmosphere. Uh, but he basically states we are nothing but, once again, he's boiling us down to nothing, boiling us down to our most rudimentary thing, and he says we are nothing but sexual creatures. That's, that's the only thing we're, we're here for. And he broke us down into two categories, the repressed and the liberated. But let me bring up one more. This is more of a modern person. Has anybody heard of Yuval Noah Harari. Yes, sir. I knew I'd get somebody. I guess it was you too, buddy. You know this stuff. Yes, sir. You, he I'm is... What was that? I'm working on it. Yeah. Uh, Yuval Noah Harari is probably the top atheistic voice of this world today. Okay? He, truly, truly he is. Um, he has wrote, he's written a New York Times bestseller, and he's an author uh, of a, uh, a book called Sapiens. And when I say New York Times bestseller, some people go, oh, yeah, 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 every, every book is on the New York Times bestseller. No, I mean, this has been on the top list of New York Times bestsellers so long, it could, could actually go down as, like, change out who the top selling book in the New York Times has ever been globally. Like, it's been on the list for so long that this book is, yeah, a lot of people are reading it. But this is Animal Man, and he points out that humanity is nothing more, nothing less, than physical urges and us reacting to them and engaging with those physical urges. So let me just read some insights uh, of things that he's either said or have been in his book. Free will is a myth inherited from Christian theology. Hmm. It's interesting. Although I would agree that free will is something that God has instituted as a loving, beautiful thing, I would say that I, I don't think it came from Christian theology. Human beings have no natural rights, just as spiders, hyenas, and chimpanzees have no natural rights. You are nothing more than a spider. You're nothing more than a hyena. As far as we can tell from a purely scientific viewpoint, human life has absolutely no meaning. Humans are the outcome of blind evolutionary processes that operate without goal or purpose. It's real encouraging, guys. Sorry to start with on a downer here. Uh, hence, any meaning that people ascribe to their lives is just a what? What does that say? Is just a delusion. Yeah, I know. I just gave you a whole bunch of a lead to swallow, didn't I? Just grrr, yeah. Uh, yeah, this, this life, I, I'm going to ask you right now, and I, I, I just, I guess, propose this. I do not understand how this man could live an enjoyable, happy, loving life. Right, I, I don't know, and I'm not trying to pick fun, guys. I'm just saying if you have a mindset, and this is what we're going to find as we continue going through this, as you have a mindset, if you believe this to be true, this is going to dictate how you make choices in life. I, I, would, I would be frightened if I could dive into this man's, man, this man's mind for five minutes because if he actually believes this, he's looking at each and every one of you as hyenas, spiders. Yeah, he is. Right. So let's take a little bit of a shift. Uh, somebody who I believe can, can pull us out of the mire of this insanity, uh, and I, I truly believe he is one of, one of the more beautiful authors that can do this, C.S. Lewis. 
The Christian and the materialists hold very different views, very different beliefs about the universe. They can't both be right. The one who is wrong will act in a way which simply doesn't fit a real universe. What is he saying? What's he trying to say? Can't love God in the world. Yep, that's that first part. The di very different beliefs, right? What about that second part that says, the one who is wrong will act in a way which simply doesn't fit the real universe. What he's trying to say here is, if the universe was created, as, as Harara was saying, that all of you are just spiders, well, then guess what? You're going to do spidery things, aren't you? You're going to do snake-like things. You're going to do hyena-like things. You're just going to react. You're going to be an animal person, right? You're just going to be reacting to your baser instincts, and that's, that's, all that, that's all it is. But hold on a second. If the real universe was based around love, was based around Messiah, was based around Christ and the creation that God has placed, just read Genesis 1 through 3. If that is the real world, then acting like a hyena, acting like a spider, acting like a snake won't fit, and something will be broken in humanity. Something will be broken in that person. It won't connect. See, on another occasion, C.S. Lewis said, and I'm not going to quote this perfectly, I, I wish I could, but he basically said something to the effect of, ducks have a desire to swim. Well, guess what? There's such thing as water. Um, birds have a desire to fly. Well, there is such thing as air that they can fly through. Okay? Moles have a desire to dig. Well, guess what? There's a soft dirt over there that they can dig through. Humanity has a desire to love. Well, guess what? There is such thing as love. See, his argument there was saying that if God created this universe, then everything in creation would have something to connect to. And what he's saying here is, it, is that if it's, about, if it's not about animal man, that he is going to be, he or she, is going to be living completely against the grain of what God has put in place. Now, by the way, materialist means someone who is atheistic. That's what they called the materialist back then. So let's talk about this Messiah. Number one, like we, like we kind of talked about, Messiah is mentioned all throughout the Old Testament. All obviously is fulfilled in the New Testament. And that was one thing that, that the kids and I, we got to talk about because we talked about the, old, the laws in the Old Testament, laws in the New Testament, da 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 da, da all that kind of stuff. And, and how we had, I had to kind of clarify that the only laws that were done away with, quote unquote, are the ceremonial laws. It's the sacrifices and things, because those all pointed to Christ, right? So this Messiah, in the Hebrew word, it's actually Mashiach. It means anointed one, set apart. Uh, consecrated. You are set aside to do something. You see, when during ancient Hebrew times, when somebody was set aside, does anybody remember what happened to David when he was young? Yes, he was anointed. Right. He was anointed. He was set aside. Okay, but when, he was anointed for what? Oh. So the anointing wasn't just some fancy little thing about getting oil in his hair and a prayer over his head. Right. He was anointed for something. You see, when they anointed somebody back then, the priests, the priests and the high priests, they would get anointed. But the purpose, part of the purpose in the anointing was to say, this person set aside for something special. This person is now the high priest, so this person is now anointed to do the high priestly duties. See, Jesus was anointed to be Messiah, to be the Mashiach, to be the one who, as we read earlier in, in Acts, to restore all things, to bring restoration to all things. You see, these, let me go back just a little bit. These right here, animal man, sexual man, physical man, all these, right? All these do not take into account violating other humans, violating the world around you, because that is how you grow stronger as animal man, as physical man, right? 
That's how you grow stronger. So what we find here is that the Messiah has a very different message. See, the entire Old Testament is messianic. Check this out. Isaiah 42, 4 says, He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he has set judgment. In other words, for judgment is justice in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. This judgment that it's talking about, a lot of times we hear the word judgment and we think, boom, bring down the hammer, right? What he's talking about here is justice. Remember that quote, that quote I gave you of C.S. Lewis about ducks and swimming and all that stuff? There was also another part of it. I just remembered it. This was part of it. He said, people desire love. Yes, well, guess what? People also desire peace. Well, there is such thing as peace. People desire, uh, people also desire justice. Don't we? We all want justice. We all want it to be righted. We all want righteousness and peace. We, uh, humanity naturally has this desire in us, but Scripture is telling us that through these other four ways, these other the four men that we just talked about, you're not going to get righteousness and peace. You're going to get war, destruction, one person clamoring over another person. You're going to get fighting. But the Messiah has something else in mind. Messiah is, by infinite and eternal contrast, the one true man. Perfect love and moving in all directions. He's the solution to this. Jesus is the solution. You see, as we live through life, our actions emerge from our belief systems. Now, if you have somebody who believes in this animal, animalistic type thing, well, guess what? That's going to reflect their actions. They're not going to care if they trample over somebody. Same with that powerful man. It's not going to care if I got to lie, cheat, and steal to try to get what I want. Why? Because I am going to be more powerful over you. So what we believe, and this is why we got to be very careful. I, I, when I said survival of the, and almost every single person here was able to, to, to say survival of the fittest. Why? Because we've been indoctrinated, guys. We've been lied to for years. And we got to be careful of that. Because for, I don't know, 40, 50 some years, they've been teaching this in our schools. But on the other hand, if you believe in righteousness and peace is what we're made for, you see, something else happens. And if we look at Jesus, if we look at Messiah and what Messiah states and what, how he lived, and we look at that and we say, I want that. I want that right there. Then that's going to shift our actions. Because if we believe that that's what it was. But you see, there's a problem. Originally, there was a problem, maybe I should say. The big story in Scripture is about this first Adam and this last Adam. So the first Adam, many of us know about. Uh, Adam, as I, as I spoke about, his name actually means man or mankind. Uh, Adam was placed in a garden. And God gave him psh, dominion over all things, right? said, here it is. But then Adam, well, he fell. Fell away from God, fell away from his relationship. And then another Adam showed up. That second Adam, or the last Adam, is who? Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, but the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Hmm, amen is right. There's something here. You see, the first Adam lived like animal man lived. I have my own impulses, and he, quite frankly, God gave him this right, chose to violate his relationship with God. Chose to go another way. So God, this is Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. By the way, I just want to side, side note, side, like, let's just talk about this for a minute. It's like 30 seconds here and talk about this. This does not say God created Adam in his image. What does it say? Oh. And then at the very end, it says he created them. 
You see, man, as in the gender, woman, as in the gender, right? Male, female. They independently are not the image of God. Okay? I just, I just want to very distinctly point that out. Okay? He created them. Right? It's them together that makes this, makes this wonderful, makes this beautiful. See, man and woman loving each other in a procreating state, this was what was, was the image of God. It was the, the beauty of being, have, having two people that love each other that want to create more of, or more of themselves. Genesis 1.28 says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. See, the first Adam was given very specific qualities, very specific things. See, he was given the image of God. By the way, the first Adam, I mean mankind, right? Image of God, dominion, and procreative ability. See, that right there is the beauty is the, the, this, was, this, was, this is the, the wonder that God created in all of this. It wasn't just, oh, image of God, dominion, and procreation. That was the perfect setup, the perfect setup, the perfect way it was meant to be. See, if you have a, an old-style watch, an old-style watch with gears and the whole shebang, right? You have something like that, if one gear is out of place, guess what? That the, the watch may not work quite right. If all the gears are in place, but you got something gummy like honey or something gross inside of it, what, what happens to the gears? Well, they get gummed up and they don't work right, right? This is the perfect gears set up, the perfect watch, the way it was made when God gave it, if you will, to Adam. This is the setup. This is what makes it beautiful. My wonderful character is in you. My character is in you. You have dominion over everything. You also have the ability to procreate. That was the flawlessness. That was the beauty. This is uh, verse 31. Then God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. See, this good means well or optimum. When you look that up, it's toa. Very good. It's the, it's the Hebrew word toa. I, I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, but toa. Toab means to be well or to be optimum. Like, this is perfect. This is built the way it was meant to be, and he handed it off. What was that? No, go for it. The best, the best right? Like, yeah, that's perfect. This is, this is it. This is, what God, this is God's pinnacle of creation on, on, on this earth. Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man, Sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. See, the first Adam had some problems. Okay? He had an identity crisis. See, theological, theologically he had an identity crisis. See, he, had, he was deceived. So there's deception in there. He also had relational problem, which was sin. And he also had a psychological problem, which was shame. Shame was something that we were never meant to feel. But let me clarify a couple of things here. See, theologically, theological, if, if you look at the word theological, okay, it, it literally means the picture of God, the, the, the picture that we have in our own mind of who God is. That, that's what it is. That, that's, theo means God. And ology is, is like the image or, the, or the, the state by which we understand it, okay? So it's the picture of God we have in our head. Relational, relational is not just vertical, it's horizontal. All sin is relational violation. All of it. Every single one of it. You think of any sin, don't. You think of any sin, it's going to be a relational violation, and psychologically, we were nev never meant to feel this thing called shame and guilt and regret. That wasn't what God made us for. Hosea 6, 6-7 says, 
For I desire mercy. You could also put in there love. Other versions say love. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But like men or like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt treacherously or faithlessly with me. This is God speaking. What this is saying is, Adam didn't trust me. And he broke covenant with me. What was the covenant? We just read it before, the characteristics. God gave him pro- procreative ability. He gave them dominion over the earth. He gave them, all, he gave them God's image. But there was this transgression. The first Adam broke it. This God, Jesus came and he was humanity's way of reflecting upon what has happened. And Jesus is the one that we see that he, was the, he is the perfect Adam. He's what Adam was meant to be. Job 31, 33, and I did not know this was in there until I started looking it up. If I have covered my transgression as Adam, Adam covered his transgression, remember? The fig leaves, he, was, he, he sinned and he was trying to hide from God and he tried to build clothes for himself. By hiding my iniquity in my bosom, in other words, trying to put it, trying to put it away, trying to hide it in my heart, trying to hide it away from God. Humanity can be characterized by obsession and addiction. Unfortunately, this, this is the endless cycle of humanity. It's sad, but it, it's true. We are constantly trying to get back. If this is what God created over here, and humanity has gone over here, everything in between is relational violation. Everything. So we are constantly going through obsessions or addictions to try to feel, we're trying to reach this area that we know exists. Ducks want water, guys. We want justice. We want love. We want peace. Even the historian that I first read in the beginning says that that's what humanity is always searching for this utopian society. God made it in the first Adam. But he violated it. And now we have been trying on our own to try to scribe and scrape and crawl back to that. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, And so it is written, the first Adam, first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Let's talk about this last Adam. The last Adam. Natural qualities. The eschatological man. Um, Does anybody know what eschatology means? It's okay if you don't. I didn't know until I started studying this either. (laughs) Uh, Esco means uh, the study of the end. Eschatology means the study of the end. It's the final events of human history. That's what it means. But he is the eschatological man. Yes, he is the last man. He is the man that is going to set up the final events of human history and has. Clock is ticking. When Jesus left, guys, an egg timer was set on the counter and it was wound up. There's only so much time until God says, okay, it's enough. Son, go get my children. He's the final rendering of man. Man as man was meant to be. What that means is he is what mankind was meant to be. He is also the eternal man. You see, Jesus is how we were supposed to be. See, Jesus, we're supposed to, Jesus was sent and he came here so that we can look at him and go, oh, that's how I'm supposed to engage with other people. Oh, that's how I'm supposed to engage with God. Oh, So now, you see, instead of us trying to crawl from this mire of what the first Adam did, so separating us from God, from the original creation, we have Jesus, and guess what he did? He left that creation and came here and says, let me bring you back. Let me show you the way back. See, Jesus is the one who writes all these wrongs. 
Romans 5.14 says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Paul knew what he's talking about here. Paul knew that the first Adam broke it all. The first Adam came in, did what he did, but he broke it all. He, he, he broke every relational violation that, that could possibly be. But who is a type of him who was to come. He is talking about Jesus and Jesus coming in, but he is not the one uh, that is a transgressor, like the Adam, like Adam. Messiah is the representative head of a new humanity. See, Jesus is supposed to be the one that we look at and we say, I want to be like that. That's right there is what I want to be like. Yes. Romans 5, 17, 4, If by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through the one, Jesus Christ. Do you see what this is saying? If you go, if, 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 if you take the gift that has been given to you, if you allow Christ into your life, if you, if you allow him to make those changes in you, that's the miracle. Do you realize that that right there is the miracle? You have all right and all ability to deny Christ, to deny God, to turn away, to violate him. And yet you have chosen to come to him. That's a miracle. Do you realize that? Even before that, you know what the miracle is? God being able to create a being that could turn away from him. Yes, free will. The last Adam has done something. He has, instead of an identity crisis here, he has an identity rescue. Theologically, he teaches us truth. This is the picture. Once again, this is the picture of God. This is the real God. Jesus comes down and says, this is the real God. This is how we actually, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Relational. This is, Jesus has, is, is spreading love in all directions, up, down, left, right, everywhere. And we look at it, even 2,000 years later, we can read this book and go, wow. And it can be relatable. The psycho, sorry, the psychological Psychologically, we, we're now innocent. The shame is gone. The guilt is gone. Ephesians 2, 14 through 15 says, For he himself is our peace. Human beings desire that. We desire love. We desire peace. We desire justice. Who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity. That is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Did you catch that? If you're letting Christ into your heart, if you are allowing him into your life, if someone out there says, listen, that Jesus fellow, I, I, there's something about him, I like him, I like him a lot, I'm going to put my guard down, I'm going to let him in, he is going to come in and he's going to begin to abolish the flesh, this, this enmity that's in there, this, all of these things that we believe we need to do in order to reach this best, this pinnacle of God's creation. But Christ himself starts breaking down those things in order to allow us and starts pulling us in that direction. Verse 16 says, And that he might reconcile them both to who? To God. In one body through the Christ, thereby putting to death the enmity. 
It was through Christ. It is through Christ in our own life that the violations that we have been making throughout our whole life will stop. Ephesians 4, 23 through 24 says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was recreated according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, humanity is remade in Messiah. I bring this whole message up to let, to, for, for one primary reason. Christ has come down and the only way to break this endless cycle of relational violation is through him. There's no other way. He is the one that gives us the ability to crawl back to God. He is the one that gives us the ability to, he gives us the path back to the creation, to the, to the recreation in, in, in our case. Jesus is the one that is humanity remade. Be part of this. Christ, if Christ is coming soon, which I believe with all my heart, he is coming soon. This has to be a message that we give everyone. Imagine if you went to somebody and said, hey, you want peace, you want justice, you want righteousness? Who's going to say, no? Are you an idiot? Absolutely not. I don't want that. Oh, no, 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 no. In our deepest in the deepest recesses of our heart, we know justice is right. We know that love is right. We know that peace is what we strive for. We know this. In, in the very core of our being, and I've, I've, I've actually used this line before, where I've talked to people and I've said, listen, do you want peace? because they were talking about how stressed they are. And I've, I've, I've said this. I said, you can only find it in Jesus. You have no idea. That person stopped in their tracks. And it's, it's, it's as though that thought had never crossed their mind before. Oh, really? And it was an open door. Humanity is desiring this remakeness. Now, mind you, and I'm sure, I'm sure Bob knows some of this stuff. Humanity right now, guys, we are do, doing all we can. And I mean this in, in a sense of genetic manipulation. I'm talking about building survival bunkers. I'm talking about humanity is going through a whole bunch of wild, crazy things. Okay? To try to save humanity. And I was listening to a commentary uh, just the other day, and he's, he said something like, I don't think the world is ever going to end. I think we'll just go on. And I said, dude, <laughs> you need to read your Bible again, buddy. It does not just go on. It gets destroyed and remade. And, and I, I know that sounds, and I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm really not. I'm just saying there has to be an end to this. this ha there has to be an end to this violation. And, and Christ is the start of that end. He is the one that has come to give us that way out. I'm going to have a, a very quick prayer and then we're going to close. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you for all you've given us. Father, I pray, Jesus, please help us to see in Messiah, in you, the peace, the love, everything that we desire as human beings to be. Help us to see it in you. I pray, Lord, that uh, as we continue on this, this Sabbath service, Lord, that you will be uplifted, you will be glorified. Father, that there will be more conversation about you, Lord, that there, there's something, something in each and every one of our hearts, Lord, that will make that change, that will break that stony heart, that will soften it, so it's something malleable, Jesus, that you can come in and start taking that enmity and start tearing it out. I pray, Lord, that you will use each and every one of us in our own lives, Lord. We need you desperately. I pray, Lord, you'll continue to use us. We love you so much and we thank you. I pray this in Jesus' name.